Good morning. Uh, we are going to start. Good morning. Um, welcome to uh, the second day, uh, the uh, symposium of uh, Sunstar uh, Symposium um, in Japan uh, by the Tower Center, co hosted by School of International Studies of Kansei Gakuin University. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce our staff who are working uh, for, to make this uh, possible. And uh, if you have any question or, um, uh, or, or for logistics, uh, please ask them. Um, and uh, first, uh, Executive Director of the Tower Center, uh, Luisa Del Rosal, uh, who is actually I think, helping others outside, I think. Uh, and then um, uh, Ray Rafidi, uh, who is uh, uh, working uh, for, also you are taking a photos, right? So, <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you want to take a photo, you know, look for him. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, Bora Lazzi, who is, I think, in the receptionist desk, and uh, Kari Hansen, um, our staff member, uh, uh, the coordination uh, manager of the Tower Center. Uh, also uh, from the KGU, uh, Mr. Osamu Takao. Um, and uh, Yutaro Oda, um, thank you very much for uh, your help. Uh, also, uh, Mariko Isozaki, uh, who is from uh, KGU, who uh, was uh, also a staff of the Tower Center from 2012 to 2014, uh, is uh, helping us today. Um, before starting, I'd like to acknowledge um, two people uh, from the, uh, to, um, for helping uh, our program. Um, uh, we, uh, we are currently uh, working doing the SME in Japan program at the Kansei Gakuin University, and uh, KGU and SMU have a strong ties uh, that started in 1980. Uh, the two years later, that will be the, um, the 40th year anniversary. We are approaching to the 40th year anniversary. Um, Dr. Haruo Iguchi uh, is uh, you know, making this uh, co-organizer from the School of International Studies. Please uh, join me for acknowledging Dr. Iguchi. Also, I'm very delighted uh, to have uh, uh, Dr. Kenjiro Hirayama, a prominent economist and who is teaching Japanese economy in the business class at the SME in Japan program. So uh, now uh, we would like to uh, start the first panel uh, about the security, uh, of, uh, um, US, uh, security aspect of the U.S.-Japan relationship. Uh, like a macro aspect of uh, international uh, relations uh, of uh, U.S.-Japan uh, relations, especially. Um, then this is the panel uh, mainly focusing on the international, international aspect. And then panel two, um, we are going to uh, focus on a domestic, a domestic aspect of uh, U.S.-Japan relations. Of course, you know, international politics and the domestic politics are interrelated, uh, needless to say. And uh, so we will have an a interesting discussion uh, today. So uh, I'd like to um, introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor Diana Newton, uh, professor of SMU, uh, my colleague. And uh, as I said yesterday, uh, Professor Newton was the only uh, Japan specialist when I was hired by SMU 10 years ago. And I'm very uh, delighted uh, to join, uh, join uh, Diana uh, for um, SMU uh, of the, uh, of the Jap uh, Japanese studies and uh, East Asian studies. Uh, she definitely has uh, made the SMU and uh, uh, SMU Tower Center a very enjoyable place, and then I'm really enjoying uh, working with her uh, at the Tower Center. Please join me for welcoming Professor Newton. Thank you very much, Hiroki, for that introduction. Thank you so much for uh, Kwansai Gakuin uh, sponsoring this conference. We're really gr grateful to be here. Looking forward to a day of interesting presentations, questions from you all, and discussion. Um, I think we can all agree it's a very tumultuous time, and we have a lot of things that um, are, I'm looking forward to hearing from you all on and, and to talking about today. Um, and I'm grateful also, obviously, to the SMU staff and the team that has brought us here and put all of this together. So the question that was posed uh, was, um, for my title, you know, who leads internationalism? Um, and the title of my talk was America First, U.S. Foreign Policy and the Politics of East Asia. Um, I think it's a great question. Who leads internationalism? 
It's one we talked about a little bit last night, um, and I think at this point in time, it is fair to say that the answer is unclear. America's power, economy, and previous engagement in institutions and alliances around the world suggests that America is still the country to be reckoned with on many important global issues. However, the way that President Donald J. Trump has implemented his campaign slogan of America First suggests that it feels a little bit more like America first out the door. Um, under President Trump, the United States has undermined the multilateral organizations and the liberal institutions that our nation has created. Last weekend, if not the United States, certainly the President of the United States gave up leading the G7 as a promoter of free trade. The President's unpredictable and sometimes capricious policy decisions should come as, an, as no surprise after 17 months in office, although somehow they do surprise us again and again. It should also come as no surprise that Trump is naturally wary of Asia. His chief campaign strategist, uh, Steve Bannon, was quoted as saying, the globalists gutted America, the American working class and created a middle class in Asia. Contrary to his predecessor, President Barack Obama, Trump holds a darker view of Asia, formulated in the 1980s when Japan was poised to take over the world. He has long held the somewhat simplified and unsophisticated view that Asia is not a place where the United States needs to be engaged in a meaningful way, with the exception of the North Korean nuclear program. He campaigned saying that South Koreans and Japanese should just get their own nu nuclear weapons so that the United States could save money and personnel in the region. Um, as we all know, there was the joint Trump-Kim uh, communique, which suggests they're going, President Trump is going in that direction by at least taking uh, U.S. South Korean military, joint military ex exercises off the table. To the U.S. President, Japan and China are global powers, boasting the second and third largest economies, backed by robust advanced militaries. In his unusually narrow view of the region, he sees no significant role for the United States to play here. I would argue just the opposite. Given that China, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan sit at the juncture of a tightly integrated seaborne trade network that sustains global business and U.S. consumption, the United States very much needs to be and should be engaged in the region. Economics is just one part of the equation. The region is rife with myriad security issues that involve the same nexus of nations. Interestingly, the United States has been involved in the region for uh, 70 plus years in order to prevent military clashes. But this involvement of the U.S. has led to a paradox. 70 years of the U.S. keeping the peace has just papered over the fault lines and the failed diplomatic efforts in the region between China and Taiwan, China and Japan, South Korea and Japan, North and South Korea, and North Korea and the entire region. Nonetheless, the U.S. presence in the region has been a stabilizing factor, and if an American decision to play less of a role leads to military action in Northeast Asia, markets and political capitals worldwide will face difficult consequences. It is unclear what President Trump's imprint will be on the region at this point in time. There is no question that this president espouses unusual methods and unpredictable behaviors in his pursuit of foreign policy. Is it possible that the hastily whipped up and hastily concluded Trump-Kim summit will lead to progress on the North Korean nuclear program? Sure. At this point, we can see that at least we're not imminently going to war with North Korea, which everyone views as a good, good result. Will China respond to Trump's threat of a trade war with more economic opening for foreign businesses, which it has hinted at doing in conversations with the Trump administration? Possibly. Could decertifying the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action for Iran's nuclear program and tightening sanctions again against Iran cause enough unrest in the streets of Tehran to topple the rep repressive and expansive clerical regime? 
Yes, any and all of these outcomes are possible, even if they are not at all likely or necessarily expected, even if the process is ugly and uncomfortable to watch. Despite his lack of preparation and lack of detailed understanding, Trump may be successful on one or more of these issues simply because he is bringing new approaches to old problems that average Americans are tired of being expected to fix. Even President Obama's election was in response to American exhaustion with jihadists, wariness of rogue states like Iran and North Korea, frustration with China's refusal to accept a peaceful rise in coordination and conjunction with the U.S. presence in the region, and personal devastation caused by the financial crisis of 2008. So as far back as then, when President Obama was elected, the U.S. public has had a foreboding that world politics and the global international order put together after 1945 is no longer benefiting ordinary Americans. President Obama responded to these feelings of frustration by doubling down on the liberal institutions and international order. He called on allies and time-worn multilateral institutions to repair and extend the system. For example, he brokered the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action for the Iran nuclear program. He negotiated an organization for the prohibition of chemical weapons program overseen by the Russians to manage the Syrian chemical weapons attacks rather than a unilateral military strike. And he put all of the U.S. weight behind the Trans-Pacific Partnership, coalescing our Asian allies in a new trading regime that he hoped would pressure the Chinese into becoming a truly free market. But these good, bold efforts of the Obama administration to pull the world together into a functioning, strong international order with liberal values did not really accomplish much, at least from the perspective of the average American. At the end of the day, it just seemed like the Iranians were likely cheating, the Russians and the Syrians were definitely cheating, and the Chinese were always going to be eating our lunch. So it should come as no surprise that President Trump rode a wave of Main Street frustration and discontent all the way to the White House in 2016. His new approach to old problems invigorated a lot of Americans. Already in just 17 months, he has bombed the Taliban. He has overseen the routing of the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. He has bombed the Syrian regime twice for using chemical weapons. He is actively battling China on trade. He has called the Iranians out on their nuclear program, and he has met face-to-face -face with Kim Jong-un. And that is just on the international front. I won't go into what he's been doing at home <laughs> and the struggles with the U.S. Congress. But as unpredictable as his actions have been, President Trump's policy agenda is only reliable in that he views every situation as a competitive transaction, which is best concluded by thinking only of oneself and not one's friends and neighbors. From his perspective, submitting to international norms or multilateral systems is foolish, weak, and likely to result in a smaller slice of pie for the United States. As the world watches President Trump in action, it feels a little bit like watching a bully take a baseball bat to many prized relationships and institutions which the United States itself spent much time, treasure, and talent on creating, upholding, and strengthening. As an observer, it is enough to make one catch one's breath, mostly because President Trump seems to enjoy the destruction and upheaval caused by his actions, nor has he ever shown any remorse. Certainly no modern president has shown similar glee in treating partners so poorly or so rudely turning his back on American alliances. It has been a long time since the United States has had a president who so thoroughly thumbed his nose at the idea of acting in the global good and acting for the global good. And in the short term, he may even have some foreign policy successes using his new techniques. As unseemly as the show is, however, don't underestimate this new American president or his private popularity. I think this is a mistake that the Democratic Party made to its deep regret, and I fear that many policy elites and those in Congress still do. Rather than focusing on how distasteful the president is, I think the more important question becomes what is the cost of his actions to the United States and to the world? Unfortunately, President Trump's intention 
even desire to make progress on the large foreign policy questions currently facing the United States uh, or facing the world at the extreme cost of damage to allies and global institutions will not stand the U.S. in good stead for the long run. As those of you here today know, every winner in the international system does not automatically create a loser, nor does every trade deficit mean the United States is being ripped off. Finally, and most importantly, an international system of rules is neither a bad thing for the world nor a bad thing for the United States. International rules and liberal institutions deter aggressors, shape national behaviors, safeguard American interests, and create mechanisms to solve global problems. Repudiating them with such glee will ultimately harm the United States as we will lose standing and credibility among other nations. Allies may feel forced to go it alone on many issues and will no longer feel obligated to support the United States on its policy agenda. America will ultimately bear some of the costs of leading the charge on acting with impunity as others follow suit. America first may ultimately result in America alone, and when this pendulum swings back, it may hit the United States hard. In the meantime, policymakers in the United States and around the world should not give up on trying to cajole Mr. Trump into doing the right thing from time to time. Thank you. Next speaker is uh, Dr. Futoshi Shibayama of the Kansai Gakuin University. Um, two years ago, we had a, a first time uh, Sun Star Symposium in Japan. Uh, we did it at Keio University. And uh, we, I invited uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Josh Robner, a security expert of SMU, who is now teaching at American University. So uh, this time, um, I couldn't uh, invite him. So I was thinking about who is the good person uh, to talk about the security and uh, especially the implications uh, of uh, uh, security issue on um, uh, international relations of East Asia. And uh, we found uh, Dr. Shibayama, I, I think, and one of the best people uh, to, uh, to talk about this issue. So uh, please join me for uh, welcoming uh, Dr. Shibayama. Uh, thank you for a nice invitation, I mean, invitation and uh, introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, the first of all, I would like to extend my warm welcome to Texans. And uh, I still remember, you know, when I went to the United States, uh, the before I started the graduate work in East Coast, I was asked by the Fulbright Commission to come over to uh, uh, Austin, Texas for uh, English education for 35 days. And it was a wonderful time, actually. I played uh, football quite well. And at the same time, you know, uh, the warm hospitality of Texan was so much uh, yeah, impressive. And uh, actually, I went to uh, New Haven with a 10-gallon hat and walking like a Texan. And, uh, and a friend of mine told me that, wow, right here in East Coast, you know, we don't walk like that. <laughs> well, anyway, I put aside, you know, uh, we have to just uh, have to deal with a little bit difficult question. And so... Uh, um, as already you guys have the, uh, the my poor resume, right? Right? Okay, if you don't have it, please circulate it, and I appreciate it. And uh, since you already have it, you know, the fault, uh, cutting in the times, and I would like to uh, not to use the uh, uh, modern equipment, <laughs> that, uh, then, you know, that we are going to take a look at the you know, 19th century stuff. <laughs> and so, well, anyway. And, and there was, the lineup is going this way, not this way, okay? Okay, going this way and then this way, okay? I appreciate it. Um, and the, the title is uh, yeah, focusing on South Korea. As you know, like now, the, the focus is on the United States and North Korea. But I would like to focus on the South Korea as a key uh, for the security of our region. And there was, and. Right now, the, uh, let's go. Let's, wait, wait, I'm going to skip quite a lot, too. Okay. And then, and then the first take a look at the number four. <laughs> okay. uh, no matter uh, how successful Mr. Trump's uh, diplomacy will be, uh, U.S. South Korea 
appeasement with quotation. Otherwise, I'm going to be complaining later. Okay, I, I'm going to put it right here. Okay, <laughs> and uh, uh, we'll continue and uh, work from the uh, the position of weakness. Well, I I, I hope it's going to work for some good reasons. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, the point is the position of weakness, which I mind. And uh, um, the first of all, you know, please take a look at the uh, uh, number four, right here on the top. Okay. Uh, well, people just focus on you know, the, the short times you know, development. Well, that's important, but you know, let's open our eyes a little bit, okay? Look at the uh, long range uh, situation. And there were plausible competitions that for the next 20 years, I just uh, try to limit you know, the numbers of the countries only to the three, and then not even including United States right here, okay? Or Taiwan, okay? But anyway. Uh, the plausible competition for the next 20 years is going to be a very tough economic competitions among the three stars, uh, the China, South Korea, and Japan. At the same time, three of them are going to suffer from the uh, low birth rate, high-speed aging, and many social dropouts. That's for sure. And among these uh, three, South Korea is going to be the lowest in birth rate. I'm going to share the, the, the surprising number. Now, the average South Korean woman is going to have only 1.05 baby in her lifetime. Wow. But I got one more striking number. In Seoul, one lady is going to have 0 0.84 baby, singular, not plural baby. And some Korean newspaper even said, in 2750, I don't think I'm going to live up to them, but the last Korean is going to perish from the earth. Isn't it shaking? Well, I was very shocked to read that one. But anyway, um, on the top, China is now having huge economic influential power over South Korea. Uh, but first of all, over 20% of South Korean trade is with China. And who do you think is having uh, the biggest national bond of South Korea? China. And uh, I hate to say, it, in Korean economy, the one weakness is you know, the huge conglomerate is having a huge power. And uh, one number even said 75% like, uh, of the GDP of South Korea is related with 10 conglomerate. 75%? Are you sure? Or that my, Japan, I mean, my own eyesight is correct or not? I don't know. But I don't know. But I was shocked to see. And I hate to mention, but you know, the, the most of the 10 conglomerate established a lot of factories inside China. Well, I, I wouldn't say more, okay. Uh, so, next slide. South Korea can be a dropout from liberal international order. Is it possible? I've been a specialist of the military def defense and also uh, military alliance, and so uh, naturally, you know, no matter how you define it, you know, the Western military alliances or even a network of the military alliances uh, has been the, uh, the foundations of the uh, liberal international order, and uh, at the same time, you know, the, during the Cold War period, it was endorsed with the uh, economic high, and uh, also the political, even ideological tie shared, and uh, uh, 
Uh, so uh, it was very comprehensive. But however, right now, you know, our, uh, our economy is getting global, certainly, but South Korea is much more global. And uh, their GDP is uh, about 50% of GDP is depending upon the, uh, the trade. Wow. If trade is gone, what's going to happen? You know? And uh, actually, the, uh, Japan used to be like that. But you know, the, we, we made so much effort not to be like that. And uh, the, we got a very nice uh, domestic market. And so the uh, trade matters. At the same time, you know, Japan is successful from diverting from the, uh, the China market. And uh, believe it or not, our investment to the, uh, China is, is uh, almost similar to our investment to Indonesia. Well, Indonesia is a wonderful ally for us, but anyway, uh, let's put aside. Um, oops. And then, uh, South Korea's goodwill diplomacy. I hope it's going to work, but I'm really very pessimistic. And, uh, and also, uh, it's, it's going to be a little bit harmful, maybe, for liberal international order. I shouldn't predict much, but, but I, I believe so. And uh, uh, how much it's going to be, I don't know. But uh, larger than we are going to directly crush with the Mr. Trump's policy or South Korean policy, uh, I would like to uh, uh, encourage you guys to have the indirect or even a sophisticated a way of dealing with these situations. And uh, we'll always try to introduce a uh, long-term perspective and, uh, and always not to forget uh, what we establish is a wonderful one and uh, which deserve being uh, uh, maintained. That is the uh, liberal international order no matter how you define it. But anyway, uh, so I basically propose the, uh, the comprehensive package uh, to sustain the order at the same time to support South Korea. And uh, namely, uh, uh, the first of all, I would like to uh, uh, propose US-Japan joint project for establishing a developing bank for South Korea. Well, people said, well, they already have, you know, how come you need? Because it's not working. Because it's not working. Korean company isn't looking at themselves. I know your pride. I know the situation. But looking at your social welfare, yes, yeah, system is there, but how much benefit you have? Surprisingly small. You're going to be a dropout of even a status of advanced nation. So rather than claiming like this in front, I would like to gently try to introduce in developing bank, taking care of small business, and let's share this, even the technical know-how of Japanese small business with the president of a small business of South Korea. And, uh, well, it may sound ABC, but I think it's important to boost their social base. Um, but uh, probably hardest is you know, how to improve birth rate with the uh, South Korean strong cultural limit. Uh, because this is a very short presentation, you know, I wouldn't comment on that one. Too, too in detail, but because I want to say so much about it, but it's just right here. Okay, let's move. Okay. And then let's try to change this, the nature of the trade concentrations economy to uh, uh, domestic economy stabilities for South Korea, I think, which is inevitable. But somehow, somebody has to start. And uh, in promoting this, the U.S.-Japan cooperation is vital. I hate to say South Korea is a wonderful country, 
but at the same time, South Korean economy is very tiny. And with our support, it will change. And I would like to offer at the same time you know, the, uh, the promotion of the Japan-South Korean defense cooperation. I'm sure no South Korean newspaper is going to say this for the next several weeks before something happens. <laughs> okay. But I, I would like to say, and actually it's already started in a very humble way in sharing the intelligence. And uh, it's not so much uh, uh, well known. At the same time, you know, uh, uh, I basically want to propose you know, the one thing, that is Japan is going to uh, extend uh, 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 the coverage of missile defense over at first in the southern part of the uh, South Korea. To be frank, you know, with what we have right now, it's impossible to cover Seoul. But we can cover second largest city, Busan, Third largest city, Tegu, the fourth largest city, and uh, which was it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, it should be uh, very much attractive, I hope, for the Korean. And at the same time, we would like to have the, uh, uh, the, li the light to use South Korean air base for emergency. And uh, if in case you know, uh, some missile attack against Japan happens, uh, the certainly uh, we expect the U.S. Air Force is going to attack back. But at the same time, you know, according to the, my own scenario, which I examined, uh, while still you know, the first three days, uh, uh, the American attack is not big enough. And so the, uh, in a possible situation, the, you know, the uh, Japanese Self-Defense Force must participate uh, in a possible attack against the missile the, uh, bases of some countries which I cannot identify. <laughs> okay. And so uh, uh, in that case, you know, the uh, Korean, South Korean help is really vital. Uh, and so uh, uh, but at the same time, I don't think you know, the present government of the South Korea is going to agree with this package. And so uh, we have to gradually prepare the, between the United States and Japan, and we are going to uh, uh, slowly and try to uh, establish. And uh, according to the uh, situation, what's going to happen, we are going to uh, probably uh, persuade South Korean little by little. And uh, but at the same time, you know, the, uh, I, uh, I must admit, you know, the South Korean military is having a different opinions uh, from the present government. And, uh, and there's uh, quite much of uh, the good room to, for the cooperation. And uh, I don't know how much are left, but, you know, uh, uh, but if I, I put the diagrams right here the saying like, uh, the, about the missile defense. And actually, the, uh, about it, one month ago, uh, I gave the, the detailed discussions and the uh, detailed presentations on the, uh, this map, but probably uh, I would like to entertain you know, the later uh, uh, if the questions uh, come up from the uh, floor. Uh, so uh, if I'm going to uh, make a, uh, the final comments on the conclusions, so uh, the bottom line is right here. The really, uh, the number of force of the conclusion is really what I want to say. But the South Korean people are not willing or intend to avoid subordinating themselves to China's order. We, Japan, and the United States must start preparing for Western Alliance's comprehensive support for strengthening South Korean economy, society, and defense. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, so, uh, ano, slide no jumbi o onegai shimas. In the meantime, um, I'd like to uh, introduce the next speaker, um, Dr. Yasuyuki Miyake. Uh, one of the leading China specialists uh, in Japan, and uh, definitely one of the best um, China specialists in Kansai area. Um, since I started traveling uh, to KGU um, four years ago, uh, every time I visit um, KGU, I enjoy um, talking uh, with uh, Miyake-sensei. Also, I invite him 
to uh, my class uh, of the SME in Japan program, and uh, he always provides a very uh, insightful view of the Chinese politics and its implications uh, on uh, international relations. We often have a misunderstanding that uh, foreign policy is made from scratch to pursue national interest, but actually, that usually leader has to care about most uh, is uh, domestic politics. Mm -hmm. And especially, that is the case, especially so uh, for China. And uh, we often talk about how China po Chinese politics right now is, and then how, what is the implication on uh, international uh, relations. So um, I always enjoy um, the uh, discussion and conversation with my, uh, now my old friend, <laughs> uh, long time <laughs> friend, um, Dr. Miyake. And uh, um, so uh, Miyake Sensei is definitely one of the people uh, who makes my stay and visit uh, to uh, uh, KGU uh, always enjoyable. So uh, please join me uh, for welcoming uh, Dr. Miyake. Thank you very much, Hiroki. I'm very honored to be here. And my st uh, today, it seems uh, only me, and myself, and uh, Hiroki is a specialist on China. So I have to, I'm not especially, uh, I'm not especially uh, uh, studying on security issue, but um, uh, rather I'm, I'm more interested in political economy or domestic politics. So today uh, I would rather talk about the domestic issues. Uh, so let me start the, my presentation. Uh, let me start from uh, my understanding of the current situation for the liberal democracy. Uh, the, there is a serious uh, challenges, not only from the sharp powers, uh, so-called sharp powers uh, like Russia uh, or China, uh, but also uh, there is a, uh, populism is very is serious uh, issue too. So. Uh, so, and then Putin, President Putin will be uh, in power until mid-20s, and so, is, so, is, uh, so does C, uh, President C. And, and I'm, I'm afraid, uh, I, I may say, uh, that Trump administration could be uh, last longer than we hope. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, this situation would last longer than we hope, I think. But uh, so this situation reminds me of the situation, much darker situation back in the 1930s when Marxism, Leninism, and Fascism, Nazism, Japanese militarism attacked the liberal democracy. But, uh, but we, we should not forget that we survived uh, the the the, I mean, the liberal democracy survived the, in the, the World War II, and as well as uh, the Cold War. So, uh, I, what I should say is, don't give up soon. <laughs> that's that's the, today's conclusion. But uh, anyway, I, let me turn to the uh, Chinese politics. Um, in order to face the Chinese. Chinese challenge, China challenge, we have to understand uh, uh, Chinese politics. And this is um, my own way of the, uh, sorting out the Chinese politics. And then uh, I put, I call it the cognition map of Chinese uh, political leaders. And let me explain this chart. Um, the, uh, the center and then um, then there is local governments and the ordinary society, and then autonomous region of the ethnic minorities and Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, and then at the bottom comes uh, foreign relations. So uh, this means that um, the central, the, the Chinese leaders at the top are very preoccupied with the uh, center, and then then uh, think about the uh, local governments, how to use them, and then how to control the uh, society you know, and uh, the outer uh, areas. And then and finally comes the uh, foreign relations. So 
the priority of the foreign relation is rather low. I, I, that's what I understand. Then, um, this is the another, from different angle. The center, the, the, uh, for the uh, Chinese top leaders, the center, central issue is very important for them. And then um, comes the local governments. And local governments, that um, is very uncontrollable and because uh, they have their own agenda or their, their own interests. So uh, it's hard to reign, uh, hard to reign. And the society is more complicated and then autonomous areas, uh, they, are, uh, they, they have strong aspiration for independence, so uh, it's very hard to uh, control. And so foreign affairs is uncontrollable too, uh, naturally. So uh, they, the uh, top leaders feel very uh, insecure. Uh, and, and they want to maintain the control, communist control system, but um, you know, they have to, uh, so in order to maintain the uh, system, they have to control local governments and the general society in general and the autonomous areas and foreign affairs. So uh, they are quite busy and they and they also uh, here is a uh, list of the uh, Xi Jinping, uh, President Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping's positions and so uh, in order to feel uh, secure or uh, uh, he wants to control everything. So uh, he is a, a general secretary of the CCP and president of the PRC and chairman of the Central Military Commission. And so, so he is in, in charge of all, uh, the military. The chairman of the National Security Commission and he is also chairman of the Central Comprehensively Deepening Reforms Commission and director of the Financial and Economic Affairs Commission, and director of the Foreign Affairs Commission, and more, uh, leader of the leading groups for Taiwan Affairs and so on. And, and, and I can use another 10 minutes to go to, to, lead, to lead the other titles. But, uh, so, uh, but this is rather new uh, because uh, after, after Mao Zedong's disaster, disastrous cultural revolution, um, Deng Xiaoping and other leaders uh, tried to, uh, divide, uh, to, to have a division of the work. But um, so this is a division of work um, under President Hu, uh, the last administration. And let me, so, so he's in charge of military and foreign affairs and Taiwan, but the other matters are, are in charge of other uh, 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 politicians like uh, Prime Minister Wen and, and so on. But uh, now uh, it's like this, uh, the situation changed and, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, that, uh, so, so, so President Xi is in charge of military, economy, foreign affairs, Taiwan, and so on. So, and, um, but uh, what makes him to concentrate power so much to himself? I, I think he's, he feels he's not happy. And he's very, uh, he feels insecure even with this situation. And so, um, let me turn to the, so, so does the Communist Party. Uh, they, the Communist Party wants to control everything, every uh, domestic affair. And so at the state organizations, uh, at our government, uh, they, you know, the leaders or the ministers are all communists, right, as you know, and local party, committees and governments also so, uh, also the same. And as for society, economic activity, even economic activities, um, they, they want to control. And, and actually, uh, 
they are they like to uh, control market, exchange market, stock market, and, and etc. And also the now, uh, recent, more recently, uh, they ask the non-publicly owned enterprises, including foreign capitals, uh, to set up uh, a communist party organization within their uh, enterprises and to have a say in, uh, in the management. So uh, I, I, I think I can call it one enterprise, two systems, uh, rather than one, one, uh, one country, one, two systems. And so oh, they won't control everything. And so, so as for the public opinion too, um, whether virtual or real, uh, they try to uh, con uh, they try to uh, control the public opinion, and so uh, so this uh, so so that so also uh, they want to control foreign affairs too, and design so in order to um, this is to. Um, so, uh, in order to uh, achieve the, their goal, they they try to expand the Chinese sphere of influence, especially uh, maritime uh, control in South in the South China Sea, East East China Sea, and and they are going to uh, the Eastern Pacific too. And the One Belt One Road project is also, uh, and they have uh, you know. Uh, they, they want to control every uh, post in, along the uh, uh, road or belt. So, uh, and uh, as on the other hand, they they would like to they, they want to weaken the pressure from democratic powers. So, you know, their their method is to offer special treatment to friends and then to isolate anti-China power or politicians, and which is enemies for them. So, mm, sorry. So, we are facing a serious challenge. Sub subjectively, they are defensive, <laughs> but uh, for us, the, uh, this is a great challenge. And uh, the easiest solution could be this uh, China's democratization. <laughs> but uh, uh, but Chinese, Chinese political philosophy is rather antithetical uh, anti to democracy. And let me explain. Um, Usually, demo, usually, democracy in the democracy, uh, we, we think the ruler is horrible, and we cannot trust him. So uh, we we put the separation of powers, uh, uh, and then as for the as for the ruled or common people, we trust uh, their uh, we, we trust each other, right? And so we try we. we we would like to have freedom. But uh, Chinese political philosophy is like this, uh, whether traditional or modern or communist, um, or Confucianism, and they think the ruler is infallible. So they, can, they, are, they, they are happy to uh, concentrate power on, on him, uh, to him. And as for the ruled or common people, they think they they think uh, uh, they uh, they think uh, they are untrustable, not trustable. So or they need to supervise each other or put, put uh, uh, introduce harsh punishment or penalties. So this is a way of their thinking. So totally um, different. And in order to democratize uh, the Chinese society, we need to transform a billion people's mind. So uh, it's like most mission impossible. Uh, so, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. 
So I'm very pessimistic about this uh, China, China's democratization. And so uh, once they, they, they tried uh, democratization, but they failed. And as back in the 1930s or 40s, the, at the time, as I put it, the Chinese Communist Party attacked the liberal democracies. And uh, there was also Chinese Nationalist Party, KMT, uh, from, the, uh, from the right. So uh, the liberal democracy did not take root in China, uh, unfortunately. So here, here is my uh, tentative conclusion. China proceeds to pursue to maximize security and sphere of influence in order to achieve parity with the United States and as, as well as to maintain the communist rule. So subjectively, this is out of defensive concern rather than um, aggressive, con uh, aggressive desire. China, so China, and China's conduct or method as sharp powers is understood, uh, can be understood as an extension of domestic governance. They, they, they do what they, they uh, it seems to us that they are attacking very harshly, but it's ordinary work for them. So uh, every day job. And so Chinese leaders are more occupied with domestic politics than foreign affairs. And so they don't have intention to lead the world at all. And so now we are facing Chinese dream or our nightmare. And then, and this is very uh, Chinese picture uh, and then not Japanese taste. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, let me turn to the uh, final comment. Uh, implication for China, Japan, US relationship. We are in a typical security dilemma and uh, dilemma. And so Japan and US should cooperate uh, not only with each other, but also with other democratic states like uh, Scandinavian or, or the, the European state countries. And Japan and US should de decrease dependency on the Chinese market or Chinese money. This is uh, an example too. And the final one is uh, Japan and US should mend cleavages in each society. If the society is divided, you know, we, we cannot trust each other, then democracy doesn't work. So the final word is do our own homework. It's, um, it's very important for us. But still, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? So uh, that's my feeling. And spring will come for us. So, thank you very much. Thank you for ending with a bit optimistic tone. <laughs> um, so uh, our, uh, let me introduce uh, our discussant, uh, Jim Holyfield. Uh, as I said yesterday, uh, my colleague, my boss, and my friend, Dr. Jim Holyfield. So can we ask everybody just to come up to the Yeah. So uh, OK, so now uh, presenters, uh, please uh, uh, come up to the podium. And then, um, and then Jim, uh, yeah, you speak from the, from the podium. Yeah, and then at a later we will have a discussion over there. Well, I certainly don't intend for this to be a monologue, so get ready. You know, you are here this morning to interact and ask questions, and uh, we'll try to run this a little like a seminar, so especially the students over there who've been awfully quiet so far. But um, looking at the interpreters back there, um, 
I thought I would play something we call a devil's advocate. I think most of you understand that expression. And listening to these three presentations, very good, concise, cogent presentations, but each of them sort of going in a slightly different direction, I think. So the question is, as a discussant, how do you bring them together? Give them some common, some common theme. You've got to force them into a common framework. So th think about that. If you were standing up here in my position, how would you do that? Um, my first reaction is, um, as I said, for those of you who were here last night, to go back to introduction to international relations. Some, uh, how many of you in this room have had such a class? But one of the things that we were taught, or at least I was taught, is that domestic politics doesn't matter. <laughs> doesn't matter what, what kind of regime you have. Uh, who cares about America first? doesn't matter. Now, why, why are we taught that in international relations? Well, because the world is not going to change overnight. There is a structure in the international system which evolves very slowly, very slowly, and the basic distribution of power and interests in the world is not going to change very much. So my first question to Professor Newton, I'll pose a question for each of you, and then we can, you can respond, and we'll open it up for, for your comments. But does it matter? Does America first really matter? Isn't this just a lot of sound and fury? Um, is Trump really going to be able to change things that much? Um, as I said, the structure of the system is not changing that much. Um, so that's my, my challenge to you, and any of the others should feel free to weigh in. Why, why even worry about this guy? He's a, a bit of a blowhard, I think we can say that. And... Um, if we segue then to, uh, to the second uh, presentation by Shibayama Sensei, um, he's making, I think, a bit more of a radical proposition here. I don't know how many of you were listening carefully to what he had to say, but uh, it was a proposition that might warm the heart of, a, of an international relations theorist which is, and I'm sure what Shibayama Sensei is saying uh, would be very uh, attractive to, uh, to the Chinese, which is, you know, South Korea should be part of the Chinese sphere of influence. Simple as that. This is the neighborhood they live in. Um, and um, their future, their fate is tied with uh, that of China. End of, end of story, end of conversation. So why shouldn't America just face reality, fold its tent, get its forces out of South Korea, uh, let the South Koreans be in charge of their own destiny? I mean, that's sort of what President Trump has argued, right? Why, why should the U.S. be here? Why should we be engaged in South Korea? Or even in Japan, for that matter? What purpose is this serving? I think you said it. There's a sphere of influence. And you know that's a natural tendency in international relations. Countries want to have construct their own sphere of influence. Uh, some of you in here may have heard of something called a manifest destiny. Monroe Doctrine, remember that? doesn't matter what the rest of the world does as long as you stay out of the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> Don't come into our neighborhood. So why shouldn't China have the same policy, same approach? Now to Miyake-sensei. Miyake 
Um, he took us in a sort of fundamentally different direction. It reminded me uh, very much of a famous quote from a, an American politician. I met him a few times in Boston named Tip O'Neill. Some of you may remember him, a large Irish fellow from Cambridge, Massachusetts. And he had a famous quote, which is that all politics is local. Who cares about international politics in, in, in the domestic level? Uh, my colleague, Professor Matthew Wilson, pointed out yesterday, for those of you who are here, most Americans don't care about foreign policy. They don't vote on foreign policy issues. Their concerns are primarily local concerns. And, of course, how well is the American economy doing? So, again, is China not any different from the United States? We are all very provincial. <laughs> we have very local interests. And our politicians have one thing in common. They want to stay in power, hold on to power. Um, so you could almost come to the conclusion that international relations is a superfluous, you know, maybe as far as domestic politics is concerned. Um, but as I said last night... I'll, I'll conclude on this and then let each of you respond and we'll open it up for questions. Nationalism is back. Uh, it's certainly back in the United States. Uh, I think, and I would like to ask Professor Newton to explain a bit more what she means by what, well, her understanding of America first, but, but clearly it is a nationalist idea. Uh, nationalism is incredibly important in China, I think. Miyake-sensei would agree with that. Um, but here we are in Japan. You know, what about Japan? I mean, is Japan going to be um, seduced <laughs> by this new nationalist fervor? I mean, come on, you need to get in the game here. You need to whip up your people into a nationalist fervor. That's what... Chinese are doing and the Americans are doing it. So why isn't Japan playing this game? Wouldn't you stand to benefit from being more aggressive, assertive of J Japanese interests? So I'm just trying to be a devil's advocate here. I think I will stop there and uh, let's just let them respond in order quickly, briefly, and then we'll open it up for questions. So Professor Newton, you're on. Thank you, Jim. Um, I think you succeeded in being a devil's advocate since I think the question you asked me is the exact opposite of the question you asked Miyake-san um, at the end. Um, I'd like to start with your question about um, since the basic distribution of power won't change, does it matter um, what is going on in local politics in the United States? And can Trump change things very much? And I would argue that Yes, he can, and that it does matter. Um, <clears throat> very simply, I think trust is incredibly difficult to build. It takes a long time to create meaningful relationships among nations, and I think it's quite easy to destroy, and very quickly uh, trust can be destroyed and eliminated. And so I do think that... Um, these actions that we're seeing in the international realm from our commander in chief and our leader do matter. And I think um, that if you're a nation like Japan or South Korea that may feel that it faces an existential threat and that your partner of 70 years you feel is unreliable suddenly and may not show up on the day that you need them, then yes, you're gonna make other changes and you're gonna change your behavior. Um, and I do think fundamentally, from my perspective and my experience as a policymaker, the people in the room matter very much. I think that um, leadership and you know, trust and a relationship, uh, a, an ability to work together matters very, very much in terms of um, what can be accomplished and what can get done. And I think it's essential. Um, and I think in this case, if the United States is making lots of noise about 
not wanting to work with people, not planning to show up when needed, not planning to engage on issues that we have always engaged on, I, I think it's very um, likely to create a situation where other leaders around the world and other countries feel that they're going to need to make other arrangements, take other actions, create new alliances, um, new partnerships. I'm not sure that's bad, actually. I mean, I think probably um, f having these other nations feel the need to fill the leadership vacuum left by the United States can be a good thing for the world um, in some cases. I think it's bad for the United States. Um, I really do feel that we b benefit hugely from being engaged in these international institutions and international norms. But I think um, to the extent that we're not planning on doing that for the near future, I do think that others will have and will create other ideas. And the, the comprehensive um, Pacific uh, TPP that, uh, that Abe has worked on, the c comprehensive plan for Trans-Pacific Partnership, is an example of that. And they're going to move forward without us. And I think that's going to continue to happen. I think that will harm us. I think it will benefit those who move forward and create new alliances. Um, and then, just briefly, I want to go back to your idea of what's the common framework. And I think, from listening to all three of our presentations, the common framework is that we're all articulating the need for Japan and South Korea and the United States to work together to thwart an aggressive Chinese rise, I think would be um, the, the common framework. So. Uh, Professor Oliver, thank you so much for uh, the being a uh, devil's advocate, <laughs> and uh, that's uh, you're quite much burden. I know that, but uh, at the same time, I enjoy the, uh, your question, uh -huh. and uh, the, my presentation was a little bit uh, a gentleman sake. However, as you may know, the uh, the, the British gentleman is having other face of gentlemanship too, right? Okay. And uh, certainly, uh, uh, it, it's okay to uh, uh, provide a uh, nice package to um, boost uh, the social power and economic power of South Korea. On the other hand, but at the same time, you know, the, we are basically ca we no, I am calculating that, but that way, uh, Japan cannot uh, lose a front line, and uh, we don't want to be a front line against the Chinese. Uh, uh, competition, and so um, we want to take advantage of South Korea as much as possible. And uh, from, from that angle, you know, we got every reason to, uh, to keep South Korea as independent as possible from China's spheres of influence. And uh, we naturally know that. But at the same time, and uh, why well, you know, strategic consideration is very hard to sell. At the same time, you know, it. it it's sometimes, even though well, the strategic uh, consideration is very harsh and dark, but at the same time, you know, it might be helpful in the long run. And so in that case, you know, that we need the uh, uh, partnership. And the partnership is very important. So, so partnership must be based upon the goodwill. At the same time, you know, the believe it or not, the American uh, partnership with allies has been very successful in terms of the uh, sharing the friendship. And at the same time, you know, the, uh, the most American scholars basically ignored how the uh, institution worked for the uh, United States and allies. And uh, uh, compared with the uh, uh, Soviet uh, uh, network of military alliance, you know, the, the, the U.S. alliance's uh, network has been very successful in terms of the satisfying, on the one hand, the partnership, at the same time, you know, uh, uh, working for the U.S. Uh, the, and the strengths of the military setup, you know, the, uh, so far, uh, except small cases, you know, the uh, the big powers of the uh, uh, American uh, allies in the never lost to the uh, the other side, and then won the Cold War, and also working on that too, and even expanding you know, uh, the NATO wise, and so. Uh, uh, we have to uh, focus on the uh, uh, this aspect, you know, the strategic consideration is one thing, but at the same time, the partnership. And the, the sharing democracy and the sharing the uh, uh, free economy and free trade. And it, it is speak, it's by itself. And so the, uh, uh, we have a very attractive asset. And, uh, and then the last thing I just want to say, 
How come we are not nationalistic? I am very brave to say, because we don't have many dropouts. We have the problem too. 15% of Japanese people are in the class of dropout, and we must take care of that. And we will, probably. But then you imagine how many dropouts in your countries is going to contribute you know, the, uh, the wrongdoing of nationalism, whatever I mean, you may say, I don't know. And this is our problem. And South Korea is in the course of a different kind of nationalism. And right now, do we have to take a very bold measures? At the same time, it must not confront with honor, pride, or even the uh, little bit of the uh, you know their stigma. It has to be very steady and gentlemanlike. And that's, I hope. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Forhood. Um, um, I understand your question is uh, uh, nationalism is back in Japan or not. And nationalism is always there in China. And so, uh, but um, in Japan, um, it seems uh, less obvious, but uh, always there, <laughs> always <laughs> with us, and so, and I, your comment reminded me of the uh, novelist uh, uh, Haruki Murakami's comment. Uh, he compared uh, nationalism uh, to cheap wine. <laughs> he said uh, it's easy to drink, uh, drunk, <laughs> and my I, I understand his implication is that we get hungover t tomorrow. <laughs> so uh, we have already learned the, how how the dangerous nationalism is could be. So uh, we have you know we we try to drink as little as <laughs> uh, possible, and then so we. Yeah, let them try to buy a better one. And so, uh, so only, only you know the limited cases such as an uh, attack of the island or island of Senkaku or somewhere else, uh, this uh, nationalism can be lit. But uh, otherwise, uh, we are rather asleep peacefully. That's my comment. Thank you very much. Uh, America is going to wake up with one hell of a headache then, I think. Uh, is what <laughs> I think you may be right about that. I guess we need to get the aspirin and other things ready here. Okay, well, it's your turn, and I'm looking out here. I don't see a lot of hands going up, but uh, uh, let's start with a student here. We've got a student on the front row who has a hand up. So uh, do we have microphones or... This is a pretty cavernous room, so it might be hard to hear. So I think a microphone is coming. We have one question here from this gentleman. Um, and why don't you say who you are, where you're from? Um, I'm Zach Shively. I go to SMU. I'm in the uh, SMU in Japan program. Um, I'm interested in how an emerging nation like Vietnam, with higher and higher ratings in the freedom, economic freedom indexes each year, plays a role in these East Asia international relations? Thank you. Good question. Let's take a few questions, and that way each of you can write down the question and, and have a chance to respond to it. So get, keep your questions coming. And I see my colleague Wilson Sensei has his hand up here. Yeah, Matthew. Uh, my question is particularly for uh, Professor Shibayama uh, with regard to South Korea, because it seems to me that one manifestation of Korean nationalism is an abiding desire for reunification uh, between North and South Korea. And that seems to us to be virtually impossible. They're, they're so different economically. They're such profoundly different societies. And yet, people in Korea continually express a long-term desire to be a reunified single nation. That would be a tremendous wild card for everything that you talked about, right? Mm -hmm. Korean unification radically changes 
the whole military, diplomatic, and economic calculus mm -hmm. for, for South Korea. And so uh, I wonder, as you think about South Korea plotting its way forward and assessing its relationship with both Japan and the United States, how do you factor the possibility of Korean reunification uh, into your calculations? Okay, let's take one more question. Uh, yes, I can't remember your name. Claire, right? Yeah. <laughs> I recognize your face, I know, and I know you're an SMU student, so Claire. Hi, so I'm Claire Hewitt. I graduated from SMU last May. I'm now at Texas Law, and I'm working for the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo this summer. Uh, so I'm really, and I was SMU in Japan, and it's great, so congrats, guys. Um, my question is specifically for Professor Newton, but everyone can take a shot at it. So the idea of a changing multilateral landscape, how does Japan fit into that? Specifically, I'm thinking about the Abe-Trump relationship um, and the fact that it is a 70-year-long relationship. Do you think that America leaving will leave Japan out in the cold as well? Will it be sort of like the last domino to fall if we are realigning? Okay, we have three questions on the table, uh, one about Vietnam, one about Korean unification, and one about Japan's role in the rapidly changing international order. Who wants to start? Let me try to answer the first question. Uh, Vietnam is under heavy pressure from China, naturally. So he, uh, the, uh, the Vietnam turns to the United States and Japan and India uh, to you know, deter the, uh, the threat from China. And they have the especially uh, the maritime conflict with China. So, uh, so this is uh, one, one reason uh, they joined the TTP-11. And so they try to survive, and, uh, and but historically, uh, Vietnam is accustomed to <laughs> the pressure from China. So, <laughs> so I, I think I'm an op 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 optimistic guy, and so I, they will survive and, you know, under this pressure too. Thank, thank you. Short answer. Now to Korea. Uh, my answer is a uh, little bit. There, uh, I don't know, you know, as, as, long, as long as I know, you know, the, the, the trend of the younger generation of South Korea, and they basically want to believe that, you know, they don't want unification anymore. That two countries are just two countries, and it's different. And they don't want to take the heavy burden of taking care of, you know, 20,000, uh, no, 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 20 million poor people. And uh, they, they, they told me that, you know, that, well, I don't feel like any kinship with them anymore. And then uh, on the way back from Seoul to Japan, and some uh, Korean people said, Mr. Shibayama, please don't take that is the real voice of ours. The my uh, uh, my family's living in North Korea, and they are there. And I, I, we are really deep, deeply feeling like, you know, the, you know, the unification in the future shouldn't be forgotten. However, they are only 10% or so. And uh, without this mind, new mind, and uh, this time the uh, appeasement policy never come out. Um, thank you, Claire. Um, Claire's a former student of mine, so it's really fun to see her um, in this capacity. So at the risk of boring those of you who were here last night and heard my talk last night, I think that um, Prime Minister Abe has actually been stepping into a little bit of a vacuum um, that has been created by President Trump um, and his decision to turn his back on a lot of our alliances in the region or to at least um, be less engaged, less interested. Um, I think it is a thankless job. I don't think it has been as rewarding uh, as perhaps um, Prime Minister Abe had hoped when he, he uh, raced off to Trump Tower um, the very first time after the election. Um, but I do think that he is working hard to build a relationship with President Trump and to guide and cajole and encourage the president to do the right thing. Hasn't always worked. 
but I'm glad he's there doing it. Um, I also think that it um, is a moment that I in time that is making Japan understandably uncomfortable because Japan traditionally does not like to be the leader of the free world, right? I mean, um, Shibayama just said that um, Japan doesn't want to be the front line against China and we need to keep South Korea in the orbit. I think that's where Japan has been since World War II and is very comfortable there and is very strong there. They're such an awesome number two. They're not so excited to be number one um, in an alliance arrangement, not um, economically or anything else like that. But having said that, I think it's actually a time when Japan needs to think about being number one and taking on some leadership roles that it has happily followed the U.S. lead in. Um, I also think it's a time to think about new alliances and new coalitions. Um, I do think that Japan should work very hard to get its relationship with South Korea in order. Um, I'm not saying that it is all Japan's fault and that is a whole other topic for a whole other conference, but um, I do think that Japan and South Korea right now, especially in the face of an aggressive China an aggressive North Korea, and a dysfunctional United States, they share so many interests, and I think um, they need to have each other's back in a way that they really haven't since the end of the war. I think it's time. I also think that Japan should look actively towards India. I think Japan should start really creating a relationship with India, militarily and economically and politically. I think India is on the rise. I think India is in an aggressive um, situation with China and has a border dispute with China. I think that India has been, you know, in the Malabar exercises, the joint U.S.-Japan-Indian military exercises, I think that's been an effective deterrent in the region. And I think that that's an area where Japan should be looking to be more inventive and to try some new ideas. Also, you can find a lot of good immigrants in, in India if you need to boost your population. <laughs> okay. Uh, if I'm going to add, actually, the, I've been advocating, you know, our... Uh, uh, the possible defense cooperations uh, the, between the Japan and India. But however, you know, the, I also encourage, you know, the uh, Japanese co um, the, the part, and uh, let's use the uh, British Commonwealth framework. And one-to-one uh, 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 one -one, uh, situations, you know, we are not so much used to India yet, but, you know, uh, we got a uh, nice uh, relationship uh, with uh, Great Britain and also, also Australia. And uh, we have to uh, use, you know, the uh, international uh, institutions of what well, a part of the Western military alliance as much as possible. But can you play cricket? Uh, maybe we will. <laughs> we will. We, we got a potential, just like Americans too. <laughs> okay. I think we have time for one more quick round of questions. Uh, let's go with this gentleman here and get your questions ready. Make them quick. Okay. So. Thank you very much um, for all of your presentations. I enjoyed it. But I have a question to um, Professor Miyake regarding Chinese leadership. Uh, you said uh, China is not intending to create, say, new world order or lead the world. But I think it's more than a sharp power. I think it's an extraordinary power. Uh, it has not only you know, a kind of communist type top-down political regime, at the same time, they do have uh, mixed economies in which state enterprises can play huge roles. And they can take amazing cross-country risks, which, you know, company, Japanese, American companies cannot. And uh, buying up land in Africa, moving into, say, the Middle East, you know, any political regimes which seems quite, you know, suppressive. And um, they're not only creating uh, spheres of influence, but I do think they are creating new world order under their uh, supremacy. Uh, what do you think of this view? And they're going to make the renminbi convertible, I assume, as a tradable currency. We'll see. Yes. But let's let's take one or two oh, more yeah. questions before. Um, come on, let's go. Yeah, we have one here. We can take one more after that. Uh, Japanese, okay. Eto, 
あのまず先生のおっしゃられたですねあのなぜトランプ大統領を皆さんね心配されるのかっていうのですね、えー、一つ目の,その不確実性予測不可能で気まぐれなその外交政策っていうのは、まあえー、長期的にですねどのような代償や害を与えるのかそれをあのどのように考えているのかでまたその気まぐれ外交なので。考え,て考えられないこともおそらく起こると思うんですけどもそれはまあどんなことかなと思いながらやってますであとその不確実性社会がですね今後まあ地球規模でですね慣れてくると、まあ、国際社会でどのような社会が生まれてくるのかですねであとあのそういう気まぐれな大統領を選んだ方はどなたなのかその構造をですねあの私は知りたいと思います。でクエスチョン2としましてはその世界を牽引するためのですね要因っていうのはあの先生方はどのように分析科学的な分析をされているのかっていうのを、えーまあ、教えていただきたいなと思います。その2点です Thank you. One more question.、Um, anybody has one last question for us before we? Yes, okay. Iniguchi. Hi,、uh, Haru Iguchi.、Uh, uh, thank you for excellent、uh, presentations.、Um, with regards to、uh, the Korea situation,、um, if North Korea and South Korea manage to unify,、um, uh, how will the demographics change? Because my hunch is that North Korea has a relatively young pop population. And、um, in terms of cooperation between China and Japan,、um, there, there could be a prisoner's dilemma situation in which、uh, both parties end up not supporting、uh, economically the unification process to the extent、uh, that they should be doing. And then, the, and then Korea will be left、um, to their own devices for、uh, economic、uh, development, which、uh, will take about probably three times longer than the German unification. Thank you. Okay, let's go quickly down the row here. I'll start with Professor Newton and we'll end. Okay, I think I got the hardest question.、Um, but thank you very much for your question. I, I think there is a long run cost、um, for Trump's unpredictability and his capriciousness. I think that、um, this precarious diplomatic situation、uh, will lead to changes, disruptions,、um, a sense of We can't rely on the Americans. They won't be there for us.、Um, and not only, I think after the G7, not only will they not be there for us, but they're going to call us names, stab us in the back, you know, say all sorts of、um, sort of ridiculous things. So I think that the implication、um, is detrimental for everyone, no question.、Um, But I think the biggest cost is going to be the, to the United States as we get left behind by other nations who will feel that they have to go. Go it not alone, but without us, right? So I really do think it's a time when、um, there are going to be new alliances created, new、um, structures created, and I think that the, the real loser will be the United States as we get left out of some of these alliances and structures.、Um, I think that the future is precarious, it's unknown.、Um, I'm not exactly sure、um, that I can opine succinctly on. Um, what events will actually gonna, will happen. But I think that the people who voted for him, I think there were a lot of things that happened in that election that was sort of the perfect storm that resulted in his election.、Um, and I'm going to let Matt and Justin on their panel talk about、um, you know, domestic politics later. I, they're, they're much more,、uh, Matt, especially, is much more of an expert on、uh, American domestic politics. But,、um, so I urge you to stay for the panel after lunch. But, I would say that the people who voted for him were disappointed with the current global situation and felt that it was not making their lives better. In the post war world in the United States, our development and growth was tied to an incredible economic engine that put you know, a chicken in every pot, a car in every driveway, and made everyone feel that their lives were going. To be better and their children's lives would be significantly better. And I think that that, has, that equation 
has changed in the United States, and the average American felt disaffected, and they felt that it was time to bring someone in who was not part of the establishment, who was going to roil the pots, who was going to stir the pot, and I think that's what they wanted, and obviously that's what we've gotten. Uh, thank you for the questions, and, and uh, well, uh, this is my just prediction, okay, but, but, but hopefully uh, it's going to be right. And for 20 to 30 years, there is no unification because nobody wants except the, uh, the, the, the people I share the, the episode. And uh, probable uh, uh, development is going to be uh, North Korea's independent economic development. And uh, uh, in it, probably Japan and the United States is going to the convey a certain uh, capability building which is to enable North Korea to say no to China. And uh, I think that is going to be a, a strategic move. At the same time, you know, the independent e economic development is going to be um, acceptable for all sides. And thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Um, as I, as I put it, I still think that uh, China is uh, uh, not so much, <laughs> so much. Uh, I mean, China is very hard to govern. Uh, it's, it, the country is hard to govern. So they are, uh, the Chinese leaders are rather uh, domestic oriented. I, that, and because uh, so China's rival is China, actually. <laughs> so, uh, so, I think and they are just opportunistic, opportunistic and they, they go they just, just they can go. So uh, they, are, they don't have any big plan. Uh, they, they say they have plan, but uh, it's an empty plan and um, it's just a um, to-do list or just you know, which is not fulfilled. <laughs> so uh, I think that they, it seems you know, they are building a long, long um, wall but uh, it's very patchy, <laughs> and so we don't have to much, we don't worry about, uh, much about that. That's my answer. Thank you. We're also building a, a long wall, or at least we're trying to build a long wall. <laughs> um, I don't know if it will rival the Great Wall of China. But um, I think we've had a very interesting and intense discussion this morning. Would you join me in giving the panelists a warm round of applause? <laughs> Thank you.